Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Edson Yanaga. I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. My Twitter handle is at Yanaga. And it's a very pl great pleasure to be here at DevOps for me for the first time. Has been a great week so far, great sessions, great conference, great food, great drinks. And the most important thing, great people. Has been awesome to be here this week with you. And today I'm going to talk about microservice evolution, breaking your monolithic database, because you know everybody's talking about microservices these days. But most of us, uh, we're dealing with enterprise software, and we, we have a relational database to deal with. And the number one question that I usually have when I'm talking about microservices is, I have a legacy monolithic database. I want to split my application, my system into microservices. How do I deal with that? Because each microservice is supposed to have a separate database. How do I split these things? So I've been studying this subject quite a, a lot in the past few months or years. And I've collected a few practices that I hope will be able to help you with breaking your monolithic database. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP, which is kind of weird to have both these both titles these days. But just to say, uh, just to prove my point that the world is changing, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. We, we had some uh, strange news this week. And, uh, but I always like to start my uh, sessions with this quote, from, which is not from me, but from Forbes. Now, every company is a software company because we know software is changing the world, and I truly believe that software can change people's lives for the better and for the worse. And some of the, pro some of the, some of the very good examples of companies that are changing our world change our lives, and some of the examples that are collected is that uh, the largest car transportation company in the world owns no cars, which is Uber. The largest lodging company in the world uh, owns no real estate, which is Airbnb. The largest online retailer in the world has no stock, which is Alibaba. And the largest content network in the world produces no content, which is Facebook. All of these companies have something in common, is that they're all enabled and they're made possible through software. So clearly, software is changing the world, and we know that software can change people's lives for the better. And some years ago, I, I uh, made a choice. Uh, that's why I also like to introduce myself as a software craftsman. And one of the best definitions that I have about the software craftsman is someone that cares about what he does. And so I, I, I truly believe that software can change the world, so I can improve. I, I'm constantly trying to improve the software that I deliver, and I decided that I would be, uh, would be able to change the world for the better too, trying to help developers worldwide trying to achieve better software. So I hope that you, we, we, we will all be able to produce better software with some of the things that we're learning with this, uh, this week in this amazing conference. And of course, uh, when we're talking about DevOps and microservices, uh, we have many DevOps, microservices, we have culture change, we have process change, we have different tools to be achieving that. But for me, the most important concept about DevOps and microservices certainly is the feedback loop, because we as humans, we need to iterate constantly to know if you're doing the right thing right. And the best way to do that is to be fast in what we do, so if we can quickly access and evaluate our hypotheses and validate them into production, the better the software that we deliver. So we know the, the, the best and the fast, uh, faster feedback loop that we have, if we're able to just type the things and quickly validate what we're doing, just with static, static typing or with uh, automated unit tests or integration tests, continuous integrations. If you think about it, uh, most of the software process evolutions that we had in the past 20 years, they were all trying to improve the feedback loop that we have when trying to deliver software into production. So I think that the main thing that we need to improve when we're delivering software through DevOps and microservices is the thing that usually we're doing many different things at the same moment. And when we try to deploy software into production, we're deploying just a lot of things at the same time. We were deploying like hundreds or maybe thousands of lines that we have changed in the past week or even months into production. And when something goes wrong, it's very rare for us to, to, to know uh, very quickly uh, what was the thing that we did in the past weeks or months that's breaking things into production? So thinking about that, maybe if you could try to reduce the amount of things that we're trying to deliver into production at that given moment, and even if you could try into an ideal moment to try to commit or deliver just one thing or just a small, a small code change into production at a given moment, uh, then if something, if something breaks, we would we 
be able to quickly access if uh, where, what we did wrong with the code that we're deploying to production. And imagine also uh, about business cases. Uh, sometimes business people ask for us to develop some new feature, and we take like six months to deliver that. Everything that they thought about when they asked about the feature uh, is gone. They don't remember why they asked that. So when we deliver that into production, we don't know why we're doing that things. So imagine if for business people, if we were, qui if we were able to just quickly, oh, I have this, this uh, weird idea, maybe if to change the color of our buttons, to orange, and we're going to sell more. And if you could test the hypothesis quickly, just like in a couple of minutes or maybe a couple of hours, uh, we could be able to measure and monitor these things. So we could improve our software, we could improve our company, uh, improve our van uh, revenue, and most likely improve people's lives too. So what we this concept that we have in DevOps and microservices is called the bad size. So the most important thing for me when we're talking about DevOps and microservices is try to reduce the bad size, uh, the, the amount of things that you deliver into production into any given moment. And it doesn't matter if your, your bad size to, uh, today is like six months or it's three months or two months. I think the most important thing for, for us is to, to constantly try to improve our bad size. So we're always trying to reduce until we have an ideal moment of we will be able to just take one commit and deliver that in, uh, straight into production with continuous deployment. But uh, if you think about that, uh, not everybody needs to be Amazon or Netflix or Google uh, to be able to be doing continuous deployment. For many different enterprise companies, like delivering once a week will be more than enough for us to validate because we won't be able to validate some business things within, within a, a period lesser than a week. So we should try to find our perfect bet size, but for most of us, uh, we should always try to improve, try to reduce the, our bet size every week. But even if we try to reduce the bet size uh, every week, we as software developers, we have to deal with a problem that we have when deploying to production, which I call the maintenance window. Traditionally, uh, we, we need some time of downtime in our systems to be able to update our things. And that's especially true when we have like relational database where we're trying to deploy things into production. We have a schema for one version, and we have another database schema for the next version. And since the, both of them are incompatible, we need some downtime to apply the new release into production and probably to run some SQL scripts into production to modify our database schema. So we need a clear Maintenance window and depending on the ops guys on your company, it can be like once a month, once a week, uh, once a day or twice a day, depends many on the use case that your company has, because you can, you're not allowed to just uh, interrupt the things that users are doing daily. You have to specify, oh, we're going to uh, have a, a software update this, this, uh, this night at 2, 2 a.m., 3 p.m. Of course, nobody of, no, none of us like to be like spending our nights uh, deploying and releasing software just to figure out that we broke something else. So if you want to reduce the maintenance window, we continue to, to improve our batch size so we can deliver lesser things at production, at production at a given moment. We need some strategy to be able to be do some zero downtime deployments. And the single most uh, um, uh, simple deployment strategy to be able to achieve zero down times in what we call these days blue-green deployment. So I'll quickly pass through blue-green deployments. But traditionally, in the blue-green deployment architecture, we have some clients issuing some requests. Traditionally, we only have one deployment. Then we have to change our architecture. We have to uh, uh, add some one components in our architecture, which we can call a proxy, a load balancer, or anything else. We just add another component in our in our architecture, so we can just we can pass the request through this kind of proxy, and then for blue green deployment, instead of just having one single deployment at a given moment in production, we're going to have at least two. That's why we call blue green deployment. And when we have blue green deployments. We have the ability to we can scale uh, because now we have two production environments, two equal production environments, and then we can we have the the opportunity to be able to like take green out of production, 
update the green release. Now we have a new version running to green the, the green deployments. And then when the green comes up again, uh, when it's warm it up again and it's ready to receive new requests, then we can do the opposite thing. We can take blue out of production. We can update it. And when blue comes up again, we can put it back into our cluster. So everything uh, uh, is um, uh, updated right now. So we, we still have two environments in production. So we can do that for high availability too. But for now, we're doing that for, for, to be able to achieve zero downtime deployments. But when we, when we see zero down plan, zero down, uh, uh, blue green deployment architectures in DevOps, it's kind of easy because we're always thinking about code. Oh, we have two different versions of applications running into production. Maybe it's not that hard. But I always like to say that when we're talking about software developments, code is always easy. Uh, state is always very hard. And we're talking about state, this is like that the persistent state that our application have. Uh, because even when we're talking about session state, which uh, lives inside our application service, session state usually is some, something like that is ephemeral. Uh, if uh, we use this ephemeral state, the worst, the worst case maybe is the user has to log in again and just redo the last step that he was doing. But uh, now when we're talking about persistent states, the state is very hard because uh, this state is usually stored in a relational database, and we need some way to make, like, uh, I have a different schema in one version, or maybe different data, different data formats in one version, and this data is not compatible with the forward version that we we're applying. So how can we achieve some kind of, uh, which techniques can we apply to be able to do zero downtime deployments uh, regarding to uh, a persistent state, which is usually, uh, stored in relation to the base, which is the, 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 the scope of this talk. So number one question is, what about my relation to the databases? And the easy question is that we also need zero downtime migrations. And I don't know if any of you is not uh, familiar with the concept of migrations, but migrations is the technical term for the things that you change in your schema from one version to the other. So when, we change, when you're using like some alter table or, or some update statement that's changing the format of your data in your database from one version to the other, we call that uh, database migration. And we have some pretty popular uh, database migration tools in the Java world, which is not Java specific, but is very common in the Java world. Uh, the two most popular tools are FlywayDB and Liquibase. I think both of them are like feature complete by, by this moment because they're, uh, I consider them very mature. But my particular preference is Flyway, but it's just a matter of choice. I know that many of you use Liquibase, and it's just fine for that. Um, I used to have some uh, uh, considerations because use, usually when we're using these tools like Flyware or Liquibase, we, we try to tie the, this, the migration step of these tools into the, the, into the startup phase of our applications. And maybe when we're talking about blue-green deployments, and not only blue-green deployments, because now you can, with high availability, with uh, container clustering, now we might, we might have like three, four, ten instances of applications uh, running or starting up in a given moment. So maybe it's a better way to deal that instead of relying on, on the startup phase of your deployment process to run your migrations. Maybe it's better to get your Jenkins at an additional step run your migrations on that step to, 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 uh, to make sure that your migrations are only applied once instead of having try, uh, trying to apply multiple concurrent migrations at a given moment. Because you know, you might have multiple containers, you might have multiple instances of your application being started up at a given moment. But at least I think in Flyway, they solved this problem of uh, concurrent migrations being applied to the database. I don't know if you require a specific a database functionality for that to work properly. So I still recommend people, uh, you should be applying your migrations on a separate step on your continuous delivery pipeline. And the, and the easy answer to how do I create zero downtime migration is that migrations must be back and forward compatible. And while we're talking about zero downtime migrations, uh, maintenance windows, uh, we used to have just a monolith into production. So it's easy to uh, just to warn our users, oh, we're going to have downtime this week or this year. Or even if it wasn't easy, it was like common to do that. But now that we're having microservices and we have many different moving parts, it's very important for us to minimize even more the, the maintenance window and the downtime. Because you know, if we have like 50 artifacts or 10 artifacts into production, 
Uh, the downtime that you have into production, you have to multiply the downtime by, by the number of artifacts that you have. So it's very important, for, even more important now for us to have zero downtime deployments into each one of our microservices. And with databases, of course, we need uh, into code. They must be back and forward compatible. And our sch schema migrations, they also must be back and forward compatible. And to achieve that, of course, again, we need to reduce our batch size. And for database migrations, it means that we need, again, to do babe steps, which means that we need the smallest possible batch size into our migrations. So if you use it to create in a SQL script with like 10 lines of SQL code to do your database migration, then you need to split probably your database migration script into 10 different scripts, one uh, each one of these files is going to have a single statement, and maybe you need to get to just one single SQL statement and break into much more because we're going to, I'm going to show you some techniques to apply these during time migrations. Also, we have an issue when you try to um, to update your data to a new. You have a column you want to, ch to change the format of the data that you're storing. Maybe you're changing the format of your time zone, or you're decided to change the the value uh, uh, that you're storing in your enums. So sometimes you're, you're, you have too many rows in your table, and if you try to uh, to to execute an update statement of the whole table, it's going to take a long time, and it implies also in locking. And locking in this in this case particular case implies in downtime. We're not allowed to do that. So the obvious reasons for for avoiding too many rows and long locks in our update statements is to shard our updates. And shard is a very interesting word. Uh, we're just trying to split our data. Like we were not updating the whole table at a given moment in just a single statement. We're going to shard like I want to update just the first thousand rows. Then we're going to update the next thousand rows and keep going until we have like um, uh, the whole table being updated. So we need to measure. It depends on your specific table, your specific data, how many times your, your update statement is going to run. But maybe a, a hundreds or thousands is a, is a good number. You have to test. And of course, I can't emphasize enough. When we're doing migrations, the best thing to assure that things are gonna, aren't going to break into production is to rehearse a lot your migrations. And for that, you should have a continuous delivery uh, testing environment. You should be able to be testing your migration multiple times on your notebook, and your test environment, and your pre-production environment, and so on. So when you apply your migration to production, you have rehearsed that migration multiple times to, to make sure that you're not going to break or you're, you're not going to have long locks into production. So how can we do that? Maybe uh, I'm trying to modify my schema. I want to issue a single alter tape customers. I want to rename a column into production to another, to another name because I just I think that this name is better right now. But now, instead of just issuing one single alter tape statement, I'm going to have to have many. So this single one. Uh, just for you to take a, to, to to have some notion of how many statements are required now to apply a zero downtime migration, that single statement or outer table rename column, it should be mapped now for at least like four or five steps into production to allow your releases to be zero downtime. So instead of uh, just uh, uh, renaming a column, I'm going to add a column. I'm going to shard my updates to avoid long locks. I'm going to do some code updates to be able to do, do that in a forward and backward compatible way. And later, uh, at, into any given moment, I'm going to uh, delete that column later. So this, one, this is one of the refactors that we were able to apply with zero downtime migrations. So the basic concept here is we're never going to do destructive statements into our database. It must always be possible to recover the previous state from our database in any given release that we deliver into production. So I've collected some common scenarios uh, from many different users and companies uh, of how to apply zero downtime migrations. And I know that at the first moment, it might seem seems like a lot of work, but all of the companies that I've visited they can testify that after they, they learned how to uh, create and apply zero downtime migrations, their deployment process just improved a lot because now they're not, not worried anymore. Oh my God, do I need to worry about how many time does it take to recover the backup into production? No, because you're never destroying no information into production. You always have multiple compatible versions of your code and your schema. Uh, into production, so you can move forward and backward easily without losing anything. 
So the most common scenarios that I've collected is to add a column, rename a column, change the type or format of a column, and to delete a column. And if you think about a table as a collection of columns, then you can easily think and apply these scenarios to tables too, to relationships and everything else. So the first uh, scenario is add a column. This is the pretty easiest one. You just, first step, you're gonna alter table, add a column. Then, depending on the data that you want in the column, you have to apply update to no values to, to assign a default value, which can be issued in the alter the add column or not. Or maybe this new column, you want to compute the value based on the existing values from other columns on other table or systems. Then you have to issue your update statement, uh, of course, using sharding uh, uh, into a second statement. And then in the third release, so each one of these steps, one, two, and three, is going to be a different release into production, different versions, version one, two, and three of your, uh, of your deployment artifact into production. And later, in step three, when you have the column and you have the value, then you apply the release into production uh, where you use the column. Okay, this is the simplest one. Next one, which is kind of the most complicated one, is rename column. Rename column, we have to first add a column, copy the data using small shards, uh, multiple update statements uh, using small shards, and you have to trick, tr trick your uh, where statement for doing that. First, then you're gonna create a release that reads from the old column and writes to both column. Then next version, you're gonna create another release which reads from the new column and writes to both again. So we always have multiple compatible versions back and forward. Then version release five, your code is gonna read and write from the new column. Then uh, step six, you're gonna delete the old column. You don't have to do that because delete is a destructive statement. Most of the companies, they just take the, do clean up like once a month or once two months. They usually, they, they, they mark the columns that they want to delete later. So after one month of your release, you, you, you did like hundreds of releases into production already. So one month later, maybe that column really is not needed anymore. So you always uh, uh, delegate the delete statement to a, to a maintenance thing, which you're gonna do later, like one month later, or two weeks later, or two months later. And you see, that's the pattern that you use when you want to rename a column, and when you want to, the next scenario is, change the type and format of a column, and you see, if you get to see both slides, there's some kind of similarity, okay? So it's always the same pattern. When you want to change the type or format of a column, it's always the same steps. So it's not that hard to know how to apply zero downtime migration to production. So if you were able to split your batch size so that each one of the statements is, in, is into a different separate release into production, you're gonna be able to, be able to, to, to move forward and backward into your single releases uh, without losing data and without downtime because all of these versions are compatible with the next one and from the previous one, okay? And the, the last one is delete a column. Simply don't do that. That's a destructive statement. If that column is uh, not no, maybe you want to keep your application writing some value to that column until you do, you're, you're sure that you won't be needed anymore. So in your application, first, don't delete a column. Your application should stop using the read value from that column, but should keep writing to the column, or else you're, you won't have that data when you roll back your version of your application to the previous version. And later, again, in your sanity phase of your database cleaning, uh, which can be, again, a month or a week later, you can delete the column, okay? So delete the column is a destructive thing. You don't want to do that. Next question is, okay, I know how to do zero downtime migrations with columns and tables maybe, but what about my refer referential integrity constraints? Because we like foreign keys, etc. Et if you think about it, foreign keys are just a safety net, so we, we won't be inserting wrong data into our columns. But strictly uh, thinking about the, the, the data that we're adding, referential integrity constraints, they, it doesn't have any kind of business value to our application. It's just a safety net. So you can safe, safely remove them. So the, the quick answer is, just drop your constraints and recreate then your, all of our migrations are done. So we'll be able to, to check if everything is working. And of course, you shouldn't, again, it's just a safety net. Just because you have a safety net, you should be relying on that for your production code. Yeah? You should be assuring that you're writing the right things on the right columns. So uh, constraints are just a safety net. So now that we're talking about how to do zero-time migrations into multiple different databases, 
uh, into multiple different microservices to minimize the, down, the, the, the overall downtime that we have in our system. I get to talk to you about how can I extract my microservice database from my monolithic legacy database. I have this big uh, relational database into production. It consists of hundreds or maybe thousands, I've seen some cases like that, of tables and columns and relationships between them. First, uh, there's a question that I'm not be able to answer today, which is how do I choose which tables to extract? Uh, usually the answer is you have to apply some domain-driven design and bounded context, but uh, the most simple answer is experience. You know which, which data on your system's changing to get, change, uh, which, which, uh, which uh, amount of data in your system that change, changes together, in which data changes apart. So you need some domain experts to be able to tell uh, which data we, uh, you're going to split. So it's not the, the, in the scope of this talk, but since you have chosen uh, which tables are going to migrate to a microservice, then uh, we need to create one database per microservice. That should be, each microservice needs its own data store. It doesn't have to be a relational database, but since we're extracting uh, some data from a legacy uh, a relational database, maybe the best and simplest possible option for me to, to extract this database is to create another database into my current database, into another schema, or you can even create tables in the same schema that you have just to be able to move them later. So we're just trying to extract information to separate tables. It doesn't matter where these tables are going to be stored. It's just important for being to be in a relational database again. So be able to, 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 to craft small baby steps into this extraction. So I have a monolithic database. I want to extract this microserve database. But um, before we are able to do that, I need to uh, explain some concepts about architecture because many people are usually confused about CRUD and CQRS. And I have to be honest, I've read a lot of different definitions on the internet. They're all great, but it's very hard for us to figure out what does CRUD and CQRS mean into codes, into production, into databases. So I'll try to, uh, to give you a very simplistic uh, explanation of what is CRUD and what is CQRS regarding to database tables and codes. So if you have CRUD, the, you have the four operations, create, retrieve, update, and delete. Uh, if you're thinking about data stores, when you have a CRUD architecture, which is great for many different use cases, for many different use cases, CRUD is the best approach that you, that you can have to solve your problem. You're going to issue the write operations of your application and the read operations of your application into the same model which can mean you're going to use the same model classes in your code, and you're going to store all of these uh, operations into the same tables, into the same database. Uh, so if you're thinking about data stores, CRUD means we're storing everything in the same tables in the same database. And if we're thinking about CQRS architecture, which is a fancy name for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Uh, basically, when we're talking about code and data stores, mean that we're issuing the write operations with one model, which usually translates to a set of tables in our, in our database. And we're using the read operations into a different model, possibly in our code, and into different uh, tables in our database. So when we're trying to, to show the difference between CRUD and SecureIS regarding to data stores, uh, CRUD, you're always reading and write from the same thing. SecureIS, you're writing and reading from different tables on different uh, schemas, uh, possibly a different database, okay? So that's the basic difference, very simplistic definition of CRUD and SecureRS regarding to data stores. So uh, if you're thinking, now uh, I have a monolithic database, I want to extract this information to another, uh, to a microservice database. I need, uh, I don't want to do that in a big bang step, you know, when you do many things into, a, uh, into just a single release, many things can break, so we want to reduce the batch size. So it's reasonable to believe that for a, for a certain amount of time, uh, both microservices are gonna read from the same data store, or maybe they're not uh, gonna read from the exactly same data store, but the data, data is gonna be generated by the single uh, same source. So how can we achieve these migration steps uh, using the techniques that we have today? I've collected a few strategies that I want to share with you right now. These scenarios are 
view, materialized view, mirror table using trigger, mirror table using transactional code, mirror table using ETL tools, and event sourcing. That's the, the scenarios that I've collected for you to be able to extract your data from your monolithic application, monolithic database into a Microsoft database. So you'll be able to do that using baby steps. So first scenario, you have, a, you have your monolithic database, you can create your Microsoft data source using a view, which has the benefits of being the easiest one. You have the largest support between database uh, vendors. You have some possible performance issues depending on how you create your, your view. You have a strong consistency. Another thing that I have to explain to you, uh, difference between strong consistency and eventual consistency. I'll try to explain again in a very simplistic way. A strong consistency means that into any given moment of time, if I issue a query on my system, all of my clients at a given moment T are going to receive the same exactly value. So I have a strong consistency where everybody receives the same read value. And eventual consistency means that at, into any given moment T, if I have different clients uh, issuing queries to the same value to my data store, they might have different values, which is not inconsistent values, but maybe one of these values is uh, like an um, outdated value. But eventually, all of the clients into, a, into, into the future will be able to read the same consistent value. Okay, So that's the difference between eventual consistency and strong consistency. And many people believe that in our systems, we must design for strong consistency. But uh, it's not the case even for banks, because most of our applications, they can live and survive without strong consistency, and we can have some kind of eventual consistency in our systems. So even uh, strong consistency, depending on the database, um, uh, how do you say, visibility configurations that you have, you might even have a, some kind of eventual consistency, even if you're using transactions. So you have to think very well if you, you you won't really need a strong consistency or you can live without eventual consistency. And if you're living with, with eventual consistencies, you have to think about how much delay uh, is acceptable when you're dealing with your eventual consistency. Is my delay of updating all clients like one second, five seconds, half an hour, one hour. People that use like BI tools like for with ETL, uh, some people like they, they can survive can gender, if they receive a report of the data from yesterday. So in this case, the eventual consistency can be 24 hours. So it really depends on the use case that you're applying your, your, your code and your migrations. So for now, uh, views have a strong consistency. Well, the downside is one database must be reachable by order. Depending on the database that you use, you can use a DB link. And views, depending on the database and how you create your, your view, it can also be updatable. So you're not just um, restricted to creating a read-only microservice in a separate database. Depending on how you create your view, you will be able to create a, a read and write a microservice using this, this view. You can also use a materialized view. Materialized views, uh, usually they are implemented into the database as real tables, so it usually also has better performance. Materialized views can have strong or eventual consistency. Again, depends on how you configure your, your, your materialized view. Again, one database must be reachable by the other. You, in some databases, you, you can use a DB link, and it also can be updatable depending, depending on the database that you use. You can also use a mirror table using trigger. Uh, triggers depends on database support. Uh, you, uh, since the trigger is going to, is going to run in the same transaction as your, as your update statement, you have a strong consistency. Again, one database must be reachable by the other, and depending on the database, you, be, you, can, you will be able to create a DB link. Next scenario, mirror table using transactional code. When I say transactional code, I mean any code. It can be a store procedure code. It can be a, a distributed transaction code that Dep really depends on the technology that you're using. The important thing is uh, we're going to have a transaction. It doesn't matter if it's a single transaction in a single database application, or we're going to have a, a distributed transaction using two-phase commit and XA and everything else. So we can have store procedure distributed transactions. We might have some cohesion and coupling issues because now we're talking about specifically about distributed transactions. We might have different models and everything else. So it really depends on code right now. And depending on how you craft your, your two different applications, you might have uh, updatable 
uh, mirror tables or not. Uh, you see, in this case, you can do anything in your code. It can be updated or not. Next scenario is you can create a mirror table using ETL codes. You can use BI codes. Many use, uh, some people can use uh, some kind of dashboard tools. We can use click view. We can use, um, uh, I forgot the open source one. Talent, OK, not that one. Pentaho, OK. You can use uh, ATL tools, but you have a lot of different tools that can use extract, transform, and load into a separate database to create a mirror table. So you have a lot of different tools available. Uh, usually, these tools require an external trigger. So usually, this trigger is Scrum based, though somebody has to go into the interface and trigger the update. This update usually can take a long time. That's where eventual consistency triggers. Can aggregate from multiple data sources. You are not uh, relegated to just querying just a single data source because that's an ETL tool. Uh, and since it's, it's using ETL, uh, uh, it's really only you cannot update the mirror table that you're using uh, uh, when using ETL and ex expect your original data to, to be updated too. So that's one of the downsides, but it's also feasible depending on the, your use case. And lastly, Maybe that's the kind of strategy that we want to implement on most of the use cases when we're talking about distributed systems. It's also the most complicated one. Uh, it's event sourcing, because when we're talking about, in many of the talks and books, when we're talking about microservices, they're going to say, oh, now we have distributed database, you must do event sourcing. Event sourcing is not that easy to implement when you have a legacy application. It's OK for greenfield projects when you have a legacy. Uh, event sourcing usually implies that you have to, to change the model that you're storing your database. And it certainly is not an easy thing, because in a legacy application, you have hundreds of lines, or thousands of lines of codes uh, issuing queries to that columns and tables. So you won't be able to easily change the, your data model. But uh, uh, we can say that uh, this is the ideal scenario. Not everybody will be able to use event sourcing. The good thing about event sourcing is that the state of the data is a stream, is a stream of events instead of just a single column or a single table in your database. It eases auditing. Uh, when you're talking about event consistency, uh, event sourcing, usually you mean also event consistency. In, in, that's a requirement for event sourcing. You usually also need a distributed stream through a message bus. Talking about code, one good example of event sourcing, uh, I always give the bank account example, because we don't have a bank account. We just set the current amount using set current amount this or set current amount that. Most systems, they model bank accounts using, using CQRIS and event sourcing, because uh, you have the bank account. But the state of the data that you have in your amount, because assuming that each one of the, your bank accounts start with a zero amount, you just add transactions. And I say, uh, I create a, a, a transaction class. And this transaction, it has a, a, a number and a add or subtract uh, operation. So each one of the transactions that I'm applying to my, to my bank account, I uh, just adding or subtracting some value. So if I get, if I get to think about that, I have a, uh, I had a, a state machine, it starts with zero, and if I successfully apply all of the transactions in the same sequence at a given moment of time, I'm always going to have the same result. That's what we call event sourcing. So when we call about event sourcing, the state of the amount of, that you have in your bank account is represented by the transactions, and not by a single column in your bank account, but you can have an amount column into the um, bank account table just to cache your information because you're not you're not going to be able to always when you want to know the amount of the money that you have in your account to apply all of the transactions from 10 years ago from now uh, to compute the current value so you must have some cached value for performance reasons but basically the true data is on the stream of events, the stream of transactions, and the amount that you store in the column is just for performance issues. You can also apply snapshotting or other kind of techniques uh, to ease your auditing. But event sourcing means that uh, a secure RS and event sourcing, you, you split your data that you're reading from here and writing from here, and your true data, the true uh, information, source information, is the, stream, is the stream of events that you're creating with event sourcing. So, uh, but for that, think, if we didn't model our application using bank account and the stream of transactions, it would be very hard later, like 10 years later, five years later, or even six months later, 
to change our application code and our tables to create this, this transaction abstraction. So how can we do that using legacy applications? So one of the cool things that I want to show you today is a very nice open source project, which is kind of recent, uh, Debezium. Debezium, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the, the origin of the name is like they wanted DB. And anything that you put in a periodic table, chemical periodical table, you have you had this eum sound, so they tried dibesium to sound like a chemical element. So that's why they call that dibesium. So dibesium, it's a very cool project that's, 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 that this was created for this purpose. I have a legacy monolithic application. I want to apply event sourcing on that legacy database without changing my application code and model my legacy application code and model. So I'll be able to extract these events from my database and apply event sourcing into other um, services, which can be microservices, right? So you can think about different kind of applications. I can plug this Debezium into a current database. It's going to generate a stream of events from the changes that are issued to this database. I can read these events, and I can do that uh, with that whatever I want to populate a separate microservice database. But instead of just talking, I think it's much more, more cool for me to show and then to explain uh, further concepts. So right now, I want to show you here. I have it running already, my Debezium demo. OK, I think that I'm going to increase the font again. I'm going to increase the font so that you'll be able to see what's happening. But it's just infrastructure, OK? This is okay, the busy running. And here's my watcher. OK, so I have some things running, uh, some requirements for the Debezium The Bezium users uses Zookeeper to share um, uh, uh, co global and coordinated data. He also uses Kafka for the streaming. So the interesting thing about Kafka is that it's very it's a, like a real-time stream. It's persistent. It's very lightweight. And each one of the clients can have its own pace for consuming the messages. And each one of the clients, they also keep track of which was the last message that they received from the message bus. So Kafka doesn't have to keep track of that. Each one of the clients can, can handle it. So that's why it's very lightweight. And it's very important because uh, when the Bezium is reading the, the event log from the database, it, uh, somebody might like overwhelm the, the, the event logs, issuing a lot of different, different uh, transformation, multiple update statements, insert, deletes, and alter tables, and everything else. So it might be hard for the clients to keep the pace. Or these clients might even go offline. So I, I can't assume that all of my microservices will be online at a given moment when I'm distributing the events with the message bus. So later, when a microservice comes back online, it, it needs to be able to recover from the exactly same point that it stopped when it got down. So uh, Debezium takes care of that uh, thanks to Kafka. So I have, here I have a MySQL database running. I also have a MySQL client, so I can do the update statements and see what's happen happening. I have Debezium running on this terminal. And here I have a watch just to show you what's happening underneath, which, which, which are the messages in the event, event stream that the business generates for you. The cool thing that Debezium has support for MongoDB, MySQL, PostgreSQL, uh, and Oracle. So you'll be able to plug Debezium in all of these databases, and it's just, just going to connect. You tell Debezium which are the tables that you want to monitor. And from that moment on, the Bezium is going to generate a stream of events from each one of the uh, DDL, DML statements that you issue to your database. So if you alter a table, if you update something, if you insert something, or if you delete something, the Bezium will generate one event for each one of these cases. Okay? It uses the binary log of each one of these database, just for you to know how it works in the background. But the cool thing is, I have this database. Oops, Tori. I have some tables. Debezium is monitoring each one of these its tables. But I'm going to uh, the customers. So here I have my, uh, my table customers. It has an ID, a first and last name, and an email. If I select the information from customers, you see, I have some information here. If I am now going to use select statement, they don't, uh, they don't modify the state of the uh, database. So now I'm going to get some 
I'm going to update the first name of uh, my one of the customers and tell that uh, now the first name is Anne Marie instead of just Anne. And what, uh, what has happened in the background? Debezium generated an event, which is a JSON formatted event, which is, since it's compacted here, it's very hard to see what happened in the background. But hopefully, I'll be able to show that event to you. So if I get the formatted event here, now let's see what are information that the business generated for me. So if I get to the top of the event, yeah, you see, uh, the business generates also uh, tells me the source of the event, tells me the type of the event, tells me the payload from ID uh, 1004. Uh, it also gives me the structs, uh, which is the schema, the, cu the current schema of the table when the event was generated, so I can check the structure of the, of the table. So it generates for me the structure. It also has the type information in here, the payload. The important thing for an update statement is the payload. Here it says, before the record was N Kretschmar. Uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry. And after, uh, the first name is Anne Marie. So the business tell me the, 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 this row used to be this and now is that. So you can consume this JSON information into your application, and you can like now I'm gonna I'm gonna have a cache into my separate microservice, and I'm gonna use this information to update my current cache. So one of the things that I've did in, in the past, one of the first microservices, uh, the the microservice thing that didn't even happen in the past, but. We're trying to create a separate system that was generating reports of the transactions, the sales transactions of the users. But the user's database used to be a single uh, into a different microservice. When we're talking about microservice integration, the first thing that comes to our minds, oh, I need this, this service to consume the customer information here. So the easy thing to do is I'm, I'm going to create a REST endpoint here to expose the customers. Then I'm going to the reference the ID here of the customer. Then if I need the customer information here to generate the report, I'm just going to issue an uh, HTTP REST request to this service, and it's going to return the results, and I'll generate the report. The bad thing, it works for a single query, but when you have multiple different users generating reports for multiple customers at the same time, what happens? HTTP and REST is incredibly slow. It won't handle the amount of requests. So I had users like waiting for half an hour to get their report generated. So it's not a feasible amount of time. So you, you, you have to change that. So the first thing, I, I, I can't just rely on uh, HTTP and remote services to get the information that I want to execute my things on a microservice. I must have a... Uh, so I must have this data stored in, in my microservice, and I have some different strategies to achieving that. I can cache the information that I receive through REST, that's one of the things, or I can update the data that I have in my microservice using event sourcing and secure S. So in this particular case, if I had Debezium uh, at this project, I would be able to plug Debezium into my customer database and create this separate microservice. So it's going, oh, I need a, for the for the customer, I just need the name, uh, and the email of the customer. I don't need the address, the phone number, and everything else. I just need these two informations. So when I receive, when the, when I, this application connects to Debezium and receives the change events, I'm gonna take this JSON and see, oh, what is the new first name, last name, email of the customer? And I'm gonna update my my local database. So when I generate my report, I have everything that I need local instead of having to carry a remote service for that. That's the, the true beauty. The, the, the true beauty of event sourcing, and that's the true beauty of Debezium. Uh, we can do all of that using uh, separate streams of information. Okay, So I did that with uh, updates. I can also generate other kinds of events. I can get here. I can delete also from, from my database. I deleted a customer with ID 1004. So let's see which kind of event Debezium generated for me. Now I have this generated two events for me. So I'm gonna, gonna get one. Equal. So I have this one. Basically the payload changed before the business is same for me before. The, 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 this row used to be this and now it's no. So you don't have further information. The, the record was deleted. Maybe it's not a good thing for you to delete your records into your application because that's 
uh, that's a destructive thing. But uh, since it's a legacy application, uh, you don't get you don't get control of that, and the DBZ is very flexible for you to receive these events. And also, when we issued a delete statement, DBZ generated two different kinds of events, two different events for just a single uh, delete statement. So if I get this one. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the business generates uh, uh, an event with schema and payload no. And why is that? In this case, the business is just, is just using the, the, the compacting thing of Kafka, because maybe if you're able to read the, all of the events of the stream in a batch in advance, if you can read, oh, I'm inserting, updating, 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 updating the, the, the ID 1004, and then I'm going to do a delete, if I can batch, all of the streams, and I know that the last one is the delete. Maybe I don't need to insert, update, and update, 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 and later delete. So the uh, business sends like both uh, events. So to be able to, if you are able to batch your stream of events, you get to see, oh, the last one is a is a is a delete. So I don't have to 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 apply the insert and update statement that comes before because I'm not going to use the information later anyway. So that's one of the things for that the business does for optimization. So I can also do uh, one of the things here. Uh, Debezium also, it wouldn't be valuable if it just, Debezium is not, uh, the Debezium microservice is stopped. So nobody's receiving the changes that's, that's happening on the database right now. It wouldn't be useful for if Debezium just uh, didn't monitor the changes. So I'm just going to stop the Debezium connector. So now I can insert some values here on my database. I'm going to insert Sarah. I'm going to insert Kenneth. So, and if I get to check here the watcher, uh, I didn't have any new events uh, on the stream, so nobody's receiving the updates. But when I turn the Bison Connect again, I'm going to run the Bison Connect again on this terminal. So it's running again, and the busy know uh, looks at the banner log, which is the last event that I have, in which are the next ones. So it's going to generate the events for me. So if I get back to the events here, the busy just generate the insert uh, events that that happened when it was offline. So if I get to the, uh, get just one of these events, I'm going to show it to you here. Here's the Kenneth event. So before I didn't ha have anything. So after that, I have Kenneth Anderson. If you want to see the operation that happened, when you have an insert uh, statement, you have the OP here is C, which is to create. If you have an update statement, the, op the operation here is U. So, and if you have a uh, delete, uh, there's no data, so there's no operation. So that's the things that you, that you can do with the Bezium Connect. And if you, if you can see the user case that I gave to you, separate microservice, updating my cache here, my local data using event sourcing, the Bezium is a very useful open source project that you can use in your legacy application without having to change your tables and your model that you have. You just create new things connecting to your legacy database. I think this, I don't know about you, but I think that the Bezium is an absolutely amazing project that you can use in your legacy monolithic database. So that's uh, some of the things that I wanted to show you today. I want to, you, all of you to, to join developers.redhat.com because all of the information that are presented here and much more about microservices and uh, breaking monolithic databases are going to be available. I'm also writing a book by O'Reilly about this subject. It's going to be published, I believe, in the beginning of next year. And it's going to be available at least for the first four days for free at the developers.redhat.com website. So I strongly encourage encourage you to, to register. And I also am collecting these strategies for like more than a, a year for, for, from different companies, different users. How can they split their monolithic database and how can they apply these zero downtime migrations? So if you have any feedback, any uh, downside, any new scenarios that you want me to cover, I would be more than uh, happy to, to address this the scenarios because I really want your feedback. You can you can contact me at Twitter at Yanaga or at, at my email Yanaga at redhead.com. And thank you very much.
I think we might have some time for questions, so if, you have, if any of you have any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer. But I'll also be available at the, uh, uh, well, at the hall or something. Uh, how can I, do we have a microphone, no? No? Okay. Oh, you have to go there too, okay. Oh, you can come here. Okay. Debezium for um, uh, different tables with different topics, so it generates topics in different, yeah? Yeah. The question is, is it possible to configure, configure Debezium to, to listen to different tables into different topics? The answer is yes. You can configure uh, each Debezium instance to listen to. I want this Debezium instance to connect to the, this, this databases, uh, the, the, to this database, these tables, and to publish into these topics. I have to check the documentation, but I also think that you can publish it to multiple uh, topics in the same Debezium instance. But I just need to check because, because in my, uh, my trials, I just, I just will connect to I want Debezium to connect to these tables. And I want all events that happen on these tables. You don't have to monitor all the tables in your database. You get to filter. But that's a good question. I need to address that. Thank you very much. Anything else? No? Oh, here. Do you have any tools or um, uh, frameworks or things like that for the sharding? How we do the incremental updates? OK. The question is, do we have any tools or frameworks for sharding our data? Uh, so do we, don't, we don't have zero downtime. Uh, so do we don't have downtime where apply our migrations. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of any framework or tools because sh when you when you're using sharding for your update statements, it means that you have a huge amount of data. Maybe you don't have indexes, uh, so and it's too big. That's why it's taking so long or if anything else. But usually, the the most common strategy, in fact, the only strategy that I've seen people applying, is that you just get. Uh, uh, if you want to partition by ID, maybe you can update all of the even IDs in one update statement, all the uh, odd uh, in the other ones. Maybe that's too slow because you have to rehearse uh, the, your migrations. Maybe you can, uh, from one to a thousand, I'm going to apply this one, from a thousand one to two thousand, then in another update. It really depends on your application, your tables, your database. And also, when we're talking about the alter table statements, I'm assuming that the database that you're using uh, allows you to do uh, alter table statements, especially add column once with zero downtime without locking. I know that some, I'm not going to uh, say some, say the name of the vendors, but I know that the most popular vendors in the, the database space, they allow you to have zero downtime alter table statements. At least they add column one. Okay, so uh, sorry, you have to do that by hand, but of course you should be using Flyware or Leakbase to be automating your migrations. Thank you. Anything else? Is there any options, for example, to skip these events if, for example, Debezium was stopped? Yes, and I don't want to receive the events that was generated during the service was stopped. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there a way f f in Debezium for me to just ignore the events that happened when Debezium was stopped? Yeah, so I just consume the new ones, okay? Well, usually the, the, the good thing about the Bezion that restarts at, at the moment that it stopped. So usually people consider that a feature because the, the traditional way would to come back, oh, I lost everything that happened in the past two days, now I'm starting over again. Uh, I would handle that on the consumer side, but uh, I don't think that answers your question because you don't know when that happens. So yeah, the answer for me right now is, I don't know because it was because the good thing about the Bezium is that it never miss, misses an event. So if you want to miss an event, I have to talk to the engineers uh, about some music case because that's the first time I'm hearing. But I want I'll, I'll check your your answer. If you tweet or email me, I, I can check the, the answer later. So actually, a consumer is the is a Kafka consumer, so you can just say give me the latest and ignore the. What happened in the past? So okay, I have one of the engineers here. So <laughs> you can you can tell them to ignore the, the, the previous events and just start with the latest. It's, it's a Kafka feature, right? Kafka Connect client. Hmm? You just say, give me the latest. I don't want to start from that index. Just say, uh, 
Oh, yes, that's a Kafka connector parameter. Yeah, just start with the latest invest instead of uh, earliest, for example. Just from your experience, any particular recipe, zero downtime when we have stored procedures. So basically, when we update a uh, part of the application, that uses new version of stored procedure. What just Okay, the question is, uh, zero downtime with store procedures? Okay, I, I hear this question a lot too, but um, uh, the answer is, uh, I'm not a store procedure expert, so uh, it's kind of out of scope of my research about this zero downtime things. But again, if any of you has any tips or scenarios uh, how to apply the zero downtime things we using store procedures, I would be more than happy to collect them but currently, I don't have any tips or s strategies for applying zero downtime migrations using uh, store procedures. Okay? Anything else? I think time is up. But I'll be able to, to, to answer questions here and at the hall and at the conference until tomorrow. Thank you very much again.